Last year, on a perfect spring Saturday, I set off on a walk around the center of Barcelona. I've known this city my whole life, and so a stroll through the center of town is a pretty regular occurrence for me. But on this day, I went off in a slightly different direction, and what I discovered was something that both amazed me and set me off on a whole new curiosity-fueled journey. You see, I love cities. It's fascinating to think about how loads of cars and people and buildings all come together in a relatively small place and still, somehow, manage to achieve a type of functional harmony. Or at least, harmony in theory. Barcelona is an ancient city smashed between the sea and mountains with a couple of rivers defining each side to the north and south. And city life here, as in most cities, is often more of an uneasy truce between all the players crammed together. And I felt this as I swam against the jumbles of cars and bikes and pedestrians crossing on streets and sidewalks, and noticed just how aware I was of everything that was coming and going in my direction. Even on a Saturday afternoon, it was chaotic. Until it wasn't. Out of the mess of noise and crowds, I suddenly found myself walking in the area around the renovated market of San Antonio, and I felt a sense of calm wash over me. In this place, the city was very different from where I had just been. In the blocks surrounding the market, the streets had changed from a busy carscape into wide pedestrian walkways and open plazas where kids were playing and neighbors were casually strolling. There were benches and tables, playground equipment, and even trees planted in the street. I felt as if I'd wandered onto some sort of movie set. Where had the busy city gone? I sat on a bench for a while, taking it all in. This area was not completely new to me, but I felt like the last time I'd been here, it was no different than the rest of the urban city center, a competing jumble of cars and people on a bed of treeless concrete. But something had happened here to make this change. Something big, something clearly different. I needed to know more. When I arrived home, I got online and started searching for an answer. It took me only seconds to find what I was looking for, and instantly, I realized that I'd stumbled across the most captivating urban planning project that I'd ever come across. And it even had a cool name. Super Blocks! Well, super manzanas in Spanish, superillas in Catalan. But anything with the word super in it hooked me straight away. Super blocks sounded cool. But what they were trying to achieve went way beyond cool. The idea is simply revolutionary. With the goal of taking back the city from the cars, Barcelona's leaders had reached into their bag of urban planning tools and they came up with an intuitive solution. To return the city to local residents, well, they just decided to close off the streets within nine city blocks. This is the basis of a super block. And the result is that within one of these areas, noisy and smog-spitting cars are replaced with an inviting streetscape. Absolute priority is given to the local pedestrians. The streets teem with life as markets and play and socializing take the place of an area that was once filled with cars slicing up the neighborhood. Nature is also given priority as trees and gardens are planted throughout, along with plenty of benches for people to sit and enjoy the view. Noise and pollution are considerably reduced. These superblocks provide a sanctuary of tranquility in the middle of an otherwise hectic city. But how did all this change come about? Well, it turns out that Barcelona has a long history of progressive urban planning. In 1860, the center of Barcelona was still largely contained within the original city walls. It was an overcrowded mess where garbage, human waste, and disease were rampant. But for years, city officials had already begun advocating for a purposeful expansion of the city limits. Military commanders opposed this idea, pointing out that the walls had protected the city well over the years. However, after long debate, 
Several plans were submitted to the city government for consideration. And the winning commission went to this guy, Catalan engineer Ildefon Cerda. Cerda devised a plan to solve this overcrowding, which, which consisted of streets laid out in a grid pattern, connecting the old city with seven outlying towns, including Sanz, Les Corts, and Gracia. This new area, almost four times as big as the original city, was known simply as the extension, or Le Champla in Catalan. As you can see, the plan sought to expand the city in an organized and methodical way that left the center of blocks open, cutting the corners of the wide avenues to allow airflow and give a sense of open space. The plan Cerda focused on prioritizing quality human living conditions like plentiful light, air, and an abundance of greenery. It may not have come out exactly as Serdar had envisioned, but his plan was nevertheless a momentous mark in the evolution of urban planning. So in 2014, when Barcelona's planners began thinking about new ways to improve the quality of life in their city, they already had a long history of progressive urban planning to draw upon. In actuality, the city had already made some early one-off efforts into blocking out through traffic from certain neighborhoods. In 1998, they limited traffic in El Born, and in 2003, they cut off through traffic in the Villa de Gracia by raising the street level. Both of these projects created much more livable areas, but were mostly seen as one-off trials that produced pleasant anomalies. Then, what was driving the urban planners to apply these concepts citywide in 2014? You see, Barcelona, like cities around the world, was experiencing huge population growth. For many years, people had been streaming into the city from their rural homes, looking for a better life. But by abandoning the countryside, these people created a squeeze on space and resources in Barcelona. City officials were suddenly faced with a whole new set of urban planning challenges. By the time 1960 rolled around, 100 years after the Plan Cerdao was created, the population of the Barcelona metro area was 2.4 million inhabitants. Today, that's, that number stands at 5.7 million. Many of these people who came to Barcelona wanted to bring their cars with them. And these cars bring noise, traffic, and air pollution. The realization had set in that cars and fossil fuel consumption were destroying both the local and global environment as well as reducing the quality of life for city residents. Barcelona urban planners decided to act. It seemed a no-brainer that it was time to put cars in their place and give city residents the quiet, clean, and green city that they deserved. One where people, not cars, were given the priority. And just like that, superblocks were born. Except they weren't. Not immediately. You see, the vision of a city with reduced traffic that focused on local neighborhood living apparently wasn't a no-brainer. At least, not for everyone. In Barcelona, as in city governments everywhere, not much often gets done without a whole lot of talk, negotiation, and strong feelings. In Barcelona's case, because so many people feel so strongly about this unique city, the idea of making such radical changes sparked vigorous debate. There were a variety of people whose interests led them to oppose the construction of these superblocks, starting with almost anyone who owned a car and believed it to be their right to drive where and when they liked, without being sent a long way around one of these inconvenient superblocks. Additionally, residents just outside the superblocks feared that the overflow traffic from these quiet and green blocks would make their streets even more congested than they already were. And finally, there were housing equity activists who believed that the increased values of superblocks, of the apartments inside the superblocks, would bring in speculators, drive prices up, and push local residents out. On the other side were locally minded citizens who believed that preserving the quality of life in a city with an ever growing population demanded a new paradigm in urban design. 
They believed in a solution where a central feature of life was leaving cars behind in favor of quality public transportation, biking, and walking. Environmentalists rallied around the cause of clean air and fossil fuel reduction that had the potential to not only improve the city, but the planet at large. Joining them were many local merchants who welcomed the potential of increased foot traffic at their small shops within the superblocks. But it took two things to make superblocks a reality. The first was a ground-up approach to the planning of these blocks. And the second was the election of a forward-thinking socialist mayor, Aracolao. She was the political catalyst that the superblock project needed for liftoff. Though she had no experience in office, she was an ardent populist whose political philosophy was informed from her work as a housing activist. Upon entering office, she enthusiastically embraced superblocks as a positive step towards transforming her city into a model for future development. Her motto early on became, let's fill the streets with life. However, Mayor Calau wasn't the only driving force behind the superblocks. Barcelona is unique in that citywide councils of residents have a strong voice in issues affecting their neighborhoods. In each of the areas where a proposed superblock might be placed, the residents came out to offer their critiques and fears, as well as their hopes and dreams. Superblock meetings held over the course of several years were filled with detailed suggestions that were cultivated and ultimately folded in to the final designs of the superblocks we know today. This conceptualization was something that truly reflected the best of the democratic process. And while Kalau was busy bringing her vision to life, the rest of the world started watching as the residents of the first superblocks began stepping out their front doors and into a brand new world. Once people started seeing these superblocks manifested and they began using these innovative spaces, most of the dissenters were silenced. More than that, residents from across the city began calling into the mayor's office, saying just how much they wanted their own superblocks. In short, superblocks have been a huge hit in Barcelona and a stroke of genius in contemporary urban planning. But where do superblocks and projects like them fit in to the grand scheme of urban planning around the world? Since the dawn of civilization, and especially the rise of industrialization, urban planners have long been tasked with managing the intersection of people, buildings, and transport in densely populated areas. The growth of many industrial cities was driven by commercial concerns that gave little regard to the average citizen who had to live in the dirty, smog-filled streets. But over the years, things changed. Urban planning became more focused on effectively improving the quality of life for residents, while also planning wisely for future growth and developing trends. Specifically, urban planners around the world have put Barcelona under the microscope because superblocks respond to the new realities of a modern city. Its ecosystem, transport, and built environment all need to meet in a way that provides the most sustainable outcome possible. Superblocks have also been widely praised for the speed with which they were implemented. In Barcelona, six superblocks have been completed in only four short years. Beyond that, urban planners everywhere are captivated by the potential of making such profound changes with minimal negative impact to existing infrastructure. Around the world, there are scores of other cities, such as Brussels, Berlin, and Ljubljana, studying these superblocks and eyeing their use. In short, the world loves superblocks. <laughs> Yet, will these superblocks work everywhere? Well, not exactly. You see, the positive benefits of superblocks are achieved best in densely populated areas. For superblocks to work, orderly grid patterns of streets are essential, like those of Le Chample or like so much of Manhattan. And since superblocks de-emphasize the status of cars, it's imperative that cities adopting this model also have a competent public transportation system. 
which is not the case in many parts of the world. Of course, superblocks would obviously not make much sense in the suburbs, but with that being said, they do work in older, small towns with a nuclear center. For instance, in the United States alone, cities and towns as diverse as San Diego, Boulder, and Burlington have all put some viable version of superblocks in place. And those who choose to embrace superblocks will transform their cities from car chaos into green tranquility, quickly and without enormous expense. In superblocks, no longer will people wonder what route they'll drive across the city. They will ask themselves if they even need to take the car at all. But don't take my word for it. Go visit a superblock for yourself. Go watch the people playing and socializing and feast your eyes on all the different trees and flowers that enhance the landscape. Experience the same amazed pleasure that I did by standing right in the center of what used to be a busy street and gaze up at some of Barcelona's finest architecture. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, superblocks aren't just an inspiration to other, older cities around the world on how to improve neighborhood life. They're an inspiration to all of humanity. They show us that when new ideas are allowed to flourish, when community members get a meaningful say in the design of their own lives, and when we elect politicians who focus on the quality of life for the average citizen, that anything is possible. And in a world full of some serious problems, that is a most welcome and encouraging proposition. So, thank you, Superblocks, and thank you all for listening.